Good morning, Teachers on Fire. How are you doing on this Saturday morning? I hope you are feeling fine and recovered from the full week of school that we just completed. Welcome to Saturday Morning Teacher Talk. My name is Tim Cavia, and my goal here is just to hang out, grab a coffee, and chat about some of what I think are the most poignant valuable, important topics and conversations going on in teacher Twitter or teacher X, whatever we're calling it now. And so what I've done is I've bookmarked a handful of posts on X throughout the week and I just want to take a few minutes to highlight some of these educators and talk about what it is that they have brought up for our consideration. If you are joining me live, then welcome, and I invite you to jump into the conversation. Go ahead and throw a comment in the live chat, whether it's Facebook, YouTube, or LinkedIn, and I'd love to feature your comment here in the broadcast. I think that would be really cool and valuable for others as well. With no further ado, let's get into it. What I'm going to try to do is present my screen so I'm going to share my screen and here we go. We're going to start with, I want to start with fixing education. So fixing education is an anonymous account and I'm not always a huge fan of anonymous accounts, so I'll be honest, but they've been putting out some fire lately. They've been putting out some pretty important comments, I think. And let me just take a look at the screen. Yes, that's about how I want it to appear. So we're rocking and rolling. So Fixing Education says this, I'm amazed at teacher contracts, specifically what little time or prep is provided for teachers to actually get stuff done. If teachers only worked contractual hours, 90% of the needed work wouldn't happen even for the most efficient ones. Excuse me. So I thought this was important. It's not a new idea, but I thought we should talk about it. Let's have a real conversation about contractual hours and additional hours. So this topic was on my mind partly because I spoke with a teacher this week who told me that Right now, she's got a new grade, and she is working at the school until 5, 5.30. She's going home, making dinner, and then working again from 7 to 11. And we agree that that is not a sustainable practice, that that kind of work or that pace, putting in something like, let's say, five hours of work outside of contractual hours per day is not sustainable. And so I think when we're confronted with that, we don't want to just put our heads in the sand. We want to have a real conversation and say, what can we do? What, what, what can be tweaked here? What can we possibly change? Because we're only human beings and these kinds of hours are not sustainable. So again, I would throw that over to you. How many hours of time are you spending out of your contract hours? So outside of the bells per day, let's say on a school day, and I tend to take Saturdays off myself, but let's say on a school day, Monday to Friday, how many additional hours are you spending? I think it's an important question to look at, and you can see from this comment, from this post on X, that uh, fixing education is getting a lot of attention for this post. All right, moving on to crappy teacher. Crappy teacher. So, and now, again, I'm not a big fan of these anonymous accounts, and I'm definitely not really a, a big fan of accounts that use a poop emoji and, in my mind, are not really honoring the profession. Um, but, however, here we are at Crappy Teacher, at Teach Crap. <laughs> again, an interesting comment. So, he or she writes, My colleague is in year three of teaching. They come to my room every morning, dreading their classes. Then, after school, they come to complain. Their complaints and dread are absolutely valid. I don't know that they are going to make it. What do I say to them? So I thought I would throw that open as a comment or a question to you as well. How would you respond to this colleague? They are telling you that they are dreading their classes, they're complaining every single day, their, their attitude is super negative, and we're, of course we're not judging this person, there's lots of questions to be asked about the, the nature of their circumstance, but what do you say? What is your advice as a neighboring teacher? How do you respond? 
It's interesting that crappy teacher says their complaints and dread are absolutely valid. So maybe crappy teacher is feeling some of that same complaint and dread. But I thought it would be interesting to consider what would you say? And uh, if you are joining me on the replay, let me know in the comments, how would you reply to this colleague? Maybe you've had a colleague like this and you've had this exact scenario. Before we move on, I thought, let's just look at a few of the responses. And again, I know we're starting a little bit on the negative side, but what I'm trying to do in terms of keeping teachers on fire is look full in the face of some of the problems that we are dealing with and being real about them, being real about the challenges and in this case, the dread and the complaints. All right, let's see how some educators responded. Paul Shercliffe says, are they so stressed they can't sleep? Are they getting sick? Can they do one day at a time? I think one day at a time is a good idea. I just read this week about the one second battle. Can you make, when you hit the wall on a marathon, can you make it one more second? And if the answer is yes, then you won that one second battle. And what about the one day battle? Maybe that's where this teacher needs to be. Deb White says, ask them why they became a teacher and reflect on that. Yes, so go back to your why. Even if the profession is short staffed, we don't need to hold on to those who can't use their why to be their professional mission. I agree, Deb. I agree that hopefully as a profession, as tight and as difficult as things get, we don't need to hang on to teachers who are burned out and really have zero fire left for the job and for working with students. Uh, and that's not a slam on anyone who is struggling. I would say for your sake, I would wish you better than an existence that involves daily dread. Daniel S. Hellman says their complaints and dread are okay. So he is pushing back on crappy teacher. He says, from this, it doesn't sound like your perspective on teaching is student-centered. Maybe do some personal reflection of uh, yourself and crappy teacher pushes back on that. I won't really get into that little debate. This was interesting. CYN says, stick it out until vested in pension, then find something else to do with substitute teaching as a backup. Crappy teacher says, fully vested here is 30 years. They're on year three. I don't know that they'll make it another 27. So I don't know, fellow educator, if you're familiar with the idea of vesting, this is a really big deal. So what happens is most teachers and most schools districts all over North America have teacher pensions, right? But this idea of vestment says that you don't actually get to keep the contributions made by your employer until you are fully vested. And the vestment period will vary. At the last school I was at, the vestment period was two years. This reply is saying the vestment period is 30 years. Wow, that is, that is incredible. You have to work for 30 years in the district before you are entitled to keep the contributions from your employer. Wow. I mean, obviously you would get your own contributions back. Otherwise that would be, you know, basically just theft, but that is incredible. Okay. A little bit negative. Let's move on to some more positive stuff. This tweet or this post comes from Zach Bowermaster. Hope I'm saying your name correctly, Zach. He says, every kid should feel connected at school. Sometimes it only takes a fist bump. I love this comment. One thing I will say is that if you're familiar, if you've ever read a book called The Culture Code, and I owe a debt of gratitude to my colleague, Karin Prinsley, for referring me to this book, The Culture Code, talks about one of the trademarks of safe and healthy and effective teams or communities is physical contact, physical contact. Now, as educators, bear with me, as educators, we tend to get the eebie-jeebies when it comes to physical contact. We get a little bit anxious about that. But what I would say is that there are some tried and true, safe and reliable forms of physical contact. And a couple of those are high fives and fist bumps. 
And so in my intermediate school, formerly middle school, I like to give fist bumps at the as kids come into the building and uh, definitely as they leave, whenever I can. I'm not available every single day, but whenever I can, I like to do that. And I think after reading that book, there's something powerful. Psychologically, there is something powerful and something culture building about establishing a little bit of I want to say skin on skin again. I know we're so anxious, right? As educators to maintain professional conduct and avoid any, anything, any for, possible form of liability. But teachers, this is important stuff. Kids need a little bit of contact. And I think, Zach, you're onto something here. I want to go to Jay Wamstead. Now this one, a little bit on the negative side, but bear with me. He says... Craziest dress code story for me it was the year the kids could wear Crocs, but only if the back strap was engaged properly. I spent the year checking plastic footwear, having them remove shoes and flip straps all day long. It was not an effective use of our time. Yeah, I mean, can you imagine checking straps on Crocs all day? So this got me thinking about something that I call the culture of yes. And the culture of yes says, especially to kids, I mean, I, I am, my bias is toward the middle years. So sixth, seven, eighth grades, fifth grade. I now work in a K to seven school. They hear no from us so many times. No, you may not stand on the monkey bars. No, you may not leave the school campus no you may not run in the halls no you may not bounce a basketball in the halls no you may not chew gum no you may not wear a hoodie no you may not wear a hat no 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 lots of things and i think we have to look carefully at some of these no's and say are we running those decisions through the filter of is it good for learning and is it good for kids if we can't answer those two questions in the affirmative with whatever this prohibition happens to be, then I think we have to take a, a, a good hard look and say, why are we doing this? Because here's, here's the deal. And now I'm getting a bit on my soapbox, but here's the deal. Every time you bring in, every time we bring in a rule or a prohibition like this, like no, let's say no Crocs or no Crocs with the straps undone, whatever, no hats, no whatever it is. We are creating a point of friction between teachers and students because you can't just have the rule that is not enforced and supported. So what's going to happen is you've got educators, well-meaning educators, who are going around policing this rule. So I'll give you a couple of examples. At my son's current school, he was asked one time uh, or told one time that his... his um, a coat was not the right color, that it was uh, an inappropriate color for the school's dress coat. Another time he was challenged on his socks, um, that I think he had a, a mascot or an icon on his socks and they were supposed to be straight black. I, Whatever, if that's the dress code, fine. But here's the problem. The problem is that we, now you've created this unnecessary point of friction, right, between educator and student, and that's not helping the relationship. It's damaging the relationship. You are bringing damage, and you have to ask yourself, is the win good enough? Is the win worth it? Is the win worth it is maybe how I would put that. So thank you, Jay Wamstead. Crocs, I don't know. I have to agree with you. Probably not an effective use of teacher time to be policing Crocs all day at school. One more from Jay Wamstead here. Uh, he says, middle and elementary school homework as a parent and as a teacher, I just hate it. Studying for a test, that's fine. Reading for fun, that's imperative. Making up a missed concept, okay. But I don't assign new work that must be completed at home. These are kids. Well said. And I again, I have to agree with you, Jay. So this goes back to a conversation that we had last week about homework and that's this is basically my position now i don't know why oh i see when my i see when my background is only half on the screen then it cuts off the title okay all right i'm learning a little bit here um so let's try this view nope okay so maybe i'll just say that this is precisely my position 
that homework, yes, it's going to be, I, in my view, it's going to be essential sometimes, but not home only work is the distinction that I would make. Not home only work. And that's where I am with you, Jay, on the nature of homework, particularly, well, really at any grade, but particularly, let's say, ninth grade and under. Um, these are kids and we want to preserve their home and family life and, and schoolwork, additional home only schoolwork should not be happening. Here's a real quick one from Bethany Hill, and Bethany Hill's been a source of joy and life and hope on X, formerly Twitter, for a long, long time, really since I joined Twitter in, or really got active on Twitter, edgy Twitter, in 2018, but she shares this picture from a school that she was in, or rather a classroom. Note they've got the, the classic cinder block walls, and uh, that's unfortunate. A lot of us have to deal with that, unfortunately. But Bethany says, I love this message. I spotted it in a classroom this week. Reflect, solve, create, grow, and think. And I love how these words, uh, the common link, of course, is learning. And those are all great verbs. Reflect, solve, create, grow, think. So I wanted to share that in today's broadcast because, frankly, I think... I may need to go and copy that somewhere. I need to make some kind of a Canva version of that and get that into our school TVs, maybe put it up on the wall. Next up, I've got a quote here from Adam Grant. Now, Adam Grant is not really an educator, but he is a brilliant writer and author, and I wanted to feature this one because it does relate to my work and what I do in schools. He says, Let's see, he says, a good apology doesn't just express remorse for what we did wrong last time. It highlights what we're going to do better next time. To repair a relationship, it isn't enough to acknowledge mistakes. We need to stop making the same mistakes. Trust is regained as actions change. And I really like this idea. One of the things that I like about it is that sometimes, you know, I, I engage in restorative conversations and I think sometimes there's a there's an undervaluing of apologies or this idea that making students apologize is kind of a waste of time. They're just walking through the steps. But I here here's what I would say. Not every student apology is going to be completely authentic, completely heartfelt. I realize that. But what we're doing when we walk th students through that process is we're actually saying, this is important. This is a life skill. This is something that you need to learn. This is something that is expected. It's an important part of making relationships right. And so in my mind, a proper apology begins with owning or naming exactly what it is that we did wrong. So no equivocation, no excuses, no rationalizations. It's expressing remorse to the victim. So we need to express regret and say, I'm really sorry for doing that, or I wish I hadn't done that. We need to describe what we could have done differently. That's important. Like in that situation, here's what I should have done. You know, here's here's what would have been a better way for me to handle this. That That shows a recognition to the victim that there's an understanding of how you went wrong in the first place. And then number four is a commitment going forward. How are you going to do things differently and, and what will you do differently in the future? I know that's really close in meaning to the third one, which is what I should have done differently in the situation. But I think that commitment going forward is important to articulate and actually say. And if you can get the student to write all of this down, then you have a record of their declaration uh, of these statements and you can go back to them and say hey we apologize for hitting this person two weeks ago what's going on you know you made a commitment to change what's going on why are things going off track so i guess i would say to the cynics yes sometimes students are going to make these apologies and not fully mean them but there's still a valuable step to go through in the restorative process and Remember what we're doing, right? We're training them for real life. We're training, them, well, I know real life is a controversial comment, uh, statement, title, but we're training them for adulthood. Maybe is a more fair way to put that. Three more posts from x.com. I want to share this one from Monty Siri here in the Pacific Northwest. He is 
another must follow, just a steady stream of value from Monty. And he says, it's okay that you didn't meet the standard in quotes. If we can't say this and mean it, and if kids can't hear this and believe it, then what is it that we are doing? Our real work begins when they can't so that with our help, they can. It's not a game of sorting, it's supporting. Love this comment from Monty, and it fits well with something that I talk about here in British Columbia. The proficiency scale goes from emerging to developing to proficient to extending for any learning standard. And I've written in the past an article called We Are All Developing Learners. And part of the idea there is that, hey, for any student who is demonstrating evidence of developing proficiency, for any student who is just coming along on their learning journey, that's okay. That's okay. That That's not a reason to stigmatize a student. It's not a reason to uh, hear alarm bells or, or run around freaking out, disciplining them, right? It's simply an, a, an assessment of where they are at that moment. So when Monty says it's okay that you didn't meet the standard, what we're we're not settling. We're not lowering our standards. We're actually saying to students, that's okay. You're, you're not a bad person. You're not a dumb learner. It's all right that you're not there yet. But hey, guess what? Our real work begins when you're there because now I'm going to support you and help you to get there. So that's the other part of this equation. So this statement is not you know getting soft on learning. It's not about telling students, oh, it's okay if you don't if you don't know or understand what's going on, but it is saying it's okay, you're still valuable as a human being and as a member of our community if you're not there yet. It's my job to help you get there. And that's a much more positive message than just you got a 35%, oh well, or you got a 35%, maybe you deserve that because you didn't prepare well enough or you're slow or you're lazy or whatever we might have said 30 years ago. A couple more comments, a couple more posts here on X. I want to share two more posts from the tag team in Ontario from the Che and Pav podcast. Make sure you're tuning in, tuning in to the Che and Pav podcast. Pav has been doing some great stuff in her classroom. She says, got Lego? Here's how I introduced the Steam Builders Mindset. Task number one in my practice, she says, task number one was step one, take any 10 pieces from the bin. Take any 10 pieces from the bin. And then step two, build the highest freestanding tower using those 10 pieces. So when I followed up with Pav, she let me know that the students actually didn't know when they took the 10 pieces, they didn't know that tallest tower was going to be the challenge. So some of them, probably a bit of surprise, maybe some regret in terms of the pieces that they selected. But still, I love the design challenge. Uh, and, and we call this a creative constraint, right? This is the idea of a creative constraint. You are limited in what you can do with the in terms of how many pieces you can select and how many pieces you can use. You are limited. What are you going to do? How are you going to do it? What a great small group activity. I might have to borrow that one. I actually did one similar in some of my ADST classes here in British Columbia this week, and I'm going to continue that next week. Um, I've done tallest or highest freestanding tower. I have not limited the number of pieces. So that's that's cool. And then the second one, collaborative, uh, collaboratively, there we go, in groups, build a mythical creature. Take one minute turns. Pav, that's such a quick turn. But again, a creative constraint, right? You're limited in time. You can just imagine these middle schoolers working feverishly within the time they're given. You're limited in the time that you take. What are you going to create in one minute? What kind of a creature? Very fun, very fun. Great activity ideas there from Pav Wander. Again, make sure you're following her and tuned in. You can see the headphones there in her profile pic. Make sure you're tuned in to the Chain Pav podcast. And then finally, her partner, Che Cheney, at Mr. C. Cheney, as I return to being a classroom teacher, one thing I am reminded of is how difficult it is to wind down mentally and try to enjoy your lunch with some semblance of peace and revival. Now, I'll be real. 
maybe I shouldn't share this on the Teachers on Fire show, but I'll be real. I generally, and keep in mind, I'm a part-time administrator. I generally don't take much chill time during lunch. So I'm usually eating my lunch at my computer or with kids sitting down in a classroom. Did that uh, this week as well, engaging with kids. I'm generally not in the staff room just having a, a relaxing conversation with teachers. A, a few times in the year, I'll do that. But gen- that, I'm, I'll just admit, that is hard to do. It's really hard to do. And, and there's kind of, yes, you know, I, I know there will be a chorus of voices that say that is that is really important time. Well, yes, yes, it is. Yes, it is. But, but there are other pulling priorities, getting to connect with kids, getting back to that person who's been waiting on a response for three days, getting, you know, on and on it goes. So we get pulled in different directions and we always have the knowledge too that with a certain amount of tasks that we don't complete at school, they will often need to be completed at home. That goes back to my very first comment there from Fixing Education. So, Che Cheney, we hear you. Uh, we definitely hear you on this matter of lunch times and how do, how do we enjoy them sustainably. Teachers, if you've joined me here on the show, I'd love to hear your comments on any of these posts here on X. What are your thoughts? How do you engage? Maybe you violently disagree with me on one or some of these points. I'd love to hear about it. Leave those comments there on LinkedIn, Facebook, or YouTube. Thank you so much for joining me. And if you are listening to the podcast, uh, please subscribe to the Teachers on Fire podcast while you're there. And let's engage in more of these conversations as the year unfolds. Teachers, I want to see you on fire. Thank you so much once again for joining me. Share an encouraging message to lift up a colleague this week and keep that fire for learning burning bright. Take care and I'll see you next week. Bye-bye.